Glenn Wagner is our final recipient. He is also our Jaeger Award winner for the year, which means that in addition to presenting here, he will be presenting at the Chicago Conference, and there's special support for that in the award. He's for Fergus, Ontario, Center Wellington District High School, and cooperative strategies are the hallmark of Glenn Wagner's science classes at Center Wellington District High School. By using many learning st strategies, Wagner is able to engage all of his students and formatively assess their learning. That seems to be a key. And let's go back to Glenn's presentation. We are looking forward to hearing Glenn's presentation to this morning. And to our Jaeger awardee, Glenn Wagner. Well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll try and be uh, as brief as I can. Um, I, I want to uh, carry on a theme, and that is the idea of collaboration and, uh, um, I guess, togetherness when it comes to learning science. And I'm going to share with you an idea here on the idea of knowledge building in the 21st century. This is an, uh, something I've been playing with now for about the last five years in my classroom. And I've been quite stunned at the results that come out of this thing. And I'll, I'll start you off by... Um, giving you a picture here. Uh, why does this happen? And I think we can all empathize with this. When our kids come into our classrooms, they are very, very curious, full of ideas and full of questions. Now, somewhere along the way, and we all know this, that we kind of beat the question asking out of them. And I'm not talking about the questions of clarification or uh, the questions of understanding, but the, the real deep questions about how this idea of science actually works. Now, I, I think the picture on the right there is probably an exaggeration. I have to assume that there's going to be no classes out there that would look like that. But I do think, <laughs> maybe. But I really do think uh, that the right side, it does say something about what happens. And the research shows us quite nicely that the question asking really drops off when the kids get to middle school and into high school. And it's virtually non-existent. And I'm going to give you a quick argument here that, that perhaps is quite contrary to what we do out in the real world. And uh, that's where this idea of knowledge building comes into play here. So here's the big question. What would happen if you took ideas and questions and put them at the center of the learning, right in the middle, right, as opposed to the textbook learning that we're all so used to and that we've been a part of, okay? The thing is, though, we already know what this looks like, and all we need to do is go outside of the classroom walls, just have a peek, because if you take a look, you'll see uh, idea improvement, improving of a technology. So you start with something like the very simple car on the right and over a number of years uh, with the idea of improving the car uh, with other people and asking questions and coming up with new ideas, you come up with a really fancy schmancy sports car on the right hand side. All right. Uh, and we can see that further. Okay, we can start with the, the Walkman. Do you remember the Walkman? <laughs> yes, yeah. Holds maybe 12 songs or so, okay? But somebody came along and said, hey, let's improve this a little bit. And they got together and said, yeah, let's improve this. And now you've got the iPod on the right-hand side. And I'll, I'll leave it to your imagination, the number of improvements that was made from the left to the right, okay? And it's quite staggering if you really sit down and think about it. The, the iPods on the right hold, what, 1,200 songs, but probably even more than that versus 12 on the left-hand side. And a whole host of other innovations in there, all right? Um, creating of a technology where, uh, a medicine technology, where on the left side, of course, somebody with polio is, and uh, medicine comes along and now you're saving hundreds of millions of children every year uh, just with a simple dose. So there's an improvement in that area. Okay. And finally, uh, in my area, this is uh, physics, that's, that's my, my thing. But on the left-hand side, you have the idea of Newton's gravity. It allows us to, to send men to the moon and satellites that orbit around the Earth. And that ugly thing on the right side, the Einstein's gravity. Look, at if you came here in such a way that on an airplane or a car that used a GPS system, chances are you indirectly have used that messy bit of business on the right-hand side in order to get here within a couple of feet. Okay, so somewhere along the way, the idea of improving something where Newton's gravity couldn't do that and Einstein's gravity could. So it doesn't have to be actually a thing, it can be an idea. Okay. So here's the question. Inside this room, probably everything in here is built around improving of an idea. Okay, whether it's the clothes on your back, uh, whether it's the food that we're eating, uh, whether it's the technology that you have. At some point, everything has been improved over and over and over again. So if 
it's good enough for the world outside of the classroom. Uh, to me, I think we should be giving the kids an opportunity to play in the sandbox inside the classroom a little bit. And I think, it, like I said earlier, that's the theme of collaborative inquiry that I think is going to be a, a prominent in all of our talks here. So uh, what is knowledge building? Well, knowledge building was developed about uh, in the early 1990s by Carl Breiter and Marlene Scardamale at the University of Toronto. And, and they just had a vision of looking at the way expert organizations work and see if they can take that and bring it into the classroom. Okay? Since it works so well outside of the classroom, they thought, okay, well, how can we rejig this in such a way that we can get kids thinking about these ideas. Now they came up with these 12 principles of knowledge building and I'm only going to talk to you very briefly about four of them. And the first two I think are quite standard among a lot of uh, uh, inquiry based activities. First of all you're going to work with real ideas and authentic questions. All right? Especially questions that are going to be authentic to the kids. Right? You're going to develop shared learning goals. Now the kids are going to do that. You're not going to do that for the kids, but the kids are going to take those questions and ideas and say, hey, what is it that we can do around those things in order to develop certain goals of learning that we want to go to? Now, the next two that you see here, the share uh, knowledge among the community of the workers and also improving upon each other's work are really integrated here. In other words, if, uh, if we find something that is really interesting, we want to tell people about it. The thing about starting this in the early 1990s is there really was no way of making this knowledge public. And if you take this knowledge and make it public, then you can work on it, right? Then you can see where the misconceptions are. Or there it's, we, then you can see the aha moments and say, oh yeah, that would be great if we could take that idea and do this, that type of thing. And that really you couldn't do back in the early 1990s. But now with the technology that we have now, it's rather easy to do. And finally, the idea of improving on each other's work comes uh, uh, in hand with the idea of sharing that knowledge. So it's the last two that actually make the difference in this thing called the knowledge building community. Now, you're going to begin ultimately, and I think we all see this, with authentic questions, things that really interest the kids. So I picked four here. I, I could give you a gazillion of them, but th these are the ones that actually the kids developed, believe it or not. These are the questions that they ultimately came up with. And you'll notice, by the way, that the questions are uh, quite high level. Uh, they're not like, you know, how old is the universe? They may ask uh, that question, but perhaps a more important question is, is you know, how, how do we know the universe is 13.7 billion years old, which is a really fundamental question and really gets into a lot of really interesting learning. I mean, most of those questions that you see here are uh, cutting-edge questions. They're questions that, generally speaking, keep the experts up at night. So what would happen if you got the kids to actually work with these kind of questions? I mean, if we know it works out there, would it work in the classroom? Well, take a look. Now, I've used uh, what's called the Knowledge Form Database here. And what you see here, and I'll have to give a brief explanation here, all the little red squares that you see on the right-hand side are notes that have been posted by the kids surrounding the big idea of how black holes work. Like I said earlier, that's my area of interest in modern physics, and I get the kids to play in the sandbox that the experts do as well. And after uh, an introduction to uh, this, uh, these particular ideas, the kids then start coming up with their own questions. And so what you see here with these red dots is the kids posting notes. And in between, there's arrows where the kids are actually building on each other's work. So there's a public record of what it is the kids are asking and then what the kids are following up with as it goes along there. And on the left-hand side there, I've briefly opened up two notes. I, I know you can't read it, and I'm not expecting you to. But the point is that the kids actually post what are called little scaffolds or supports. So they say they wanted to understand something. They would click on a little scaffold in the software. It's very easy to use, by the way grade school kids use this software. And they just double click on a little um, support that says, I need to understand. And then they would write out what they need to understand. Or it, they'd click on uh, experimental evidence. And they would present some experimental evidence that they found, or uh, my theory. And they'll click on that. And they'll come up with a theory of their own about how something works. And so the conversation then becomes structured, unlike, say, for example, a blog where you know, you'd have the kids just firing stuff on there. The really important part is structuring the conversation around what it is that they're trying to best understand, okay? Now, I, I had a wonderful opportunity to workshop this idea of knowledge building to over 20 teachers in my board uh, just this past year, and, and I wanted to make sure that what I was doing wasn't kind of like the halo effect. You know, if I say, yeah, it really works great, maybe it works really great for me, but how do I know it's going to work good for other people? Right. So I got uh, 20 keen teachers, and they said they really wanted to learn how to create a knowledge building community in their classroom. So one teacher decided that they were going to work with evolution in their classroom. 
And uh, what you see here, now by the way, the interface here is the newest version of Knowledge Forum and it, it's a little bit different looking, but you can see the amount of work that the kids have done with all those notes and all the connections that are being made, that collaborative work that you're seeing, that one after the other after the other are trying to get at the questions that they find really interesting. So the two questions that you see there, what is the evidence that supports the theory of evolution and how does natural selection uh, direct the evolution of living things? Those are the kids' questions with a little bit of a push by the teacher, right? So you got to be a little true to the curriculum guidelines. So the teacher kind of pushes a little bit in a few directions, all right? So the teacher just doesn't sit back, have a coffee, read the newspaper, and let the kids go nuts. It doesn't quite work that way, all right? But you can see quite clearly the kids really jump in on this. And the comment that I got from this teacher afterwards, which surprised me, is he said, like, Glenn, you know, there's no way in the world I would have been able to get at the knowledge that the kids developed when they worked together. There's no way. And the amount of evidence that they found surpassed the evidence that he was able to provide for the kids. And that's when you know you're onto something, when the kids are working together and they're finding things that the teacher doesn't know. Really quickly, a couple of others. Here's a grade nine teacher that was doing a, an area of knowledge building under understanding exercise science. They wanted to know what, the def, what was the definition of being fit was. And also, we, you know, how much exercise is too much exercise? And the, the kids are trying to build their understanding around that. And here's another one on understanding aging. And this is mine in my grade 11 class. And, and I love this one because, you know, I dare you to ask a bunch of 16-year-olds, you know, what have you been wondering about, about getting old? Hmm? <laughs> and you'd be surprised. I was surprised at first because I asked that same question to uh, an audience about yourselves. And a lot of the questions stemmed around, you know, how do you slow down aging? You know, how do you reverse aging? And for obvious reasons, because we start looking at the other side as opposed to that side. And when you're 16, you're going to live forever. But the thing is, one of the kids and the, uh, the groups of kids came up with a question is, you know, why does the sex drive decrease with age? And I thought that was a pretty brave question to begin with. You know, I thought, okay, fine. But what was really interesting about this is that when you post the question or an idea, uh, regardless of what the question is, the learning happens around it, right? So I, I won't get you to read any of this, but when the kids, when you open up these notes, the kids start talking about hormones. They start talking about menopause, female menopause, male menopause, and they start talking about the actual chemical pathways that happen during uh, this increase in age and what happens to the sex drive. I mean, you can't teach that. The kids are actually the ones that are actually finding the research, and they're finding the latest, greatest authoritative sources on the particular uh, topic that they're working with. Um, just a couple of others. Here's, again, back to my, uh, the understanding of the quantum world. Again, you can see how the kids have really built on each other, especially on the left-hand side there. They came up with an idea that they started continually building with. And then finally, uh, understanding the evolution of the universe. Now, I had a question asked of me not too long ago. Uh, you know, how do you know that they're learning something? How do you know that when you, the kids actually go through this, that they're actually learning something significant? Well, the kids actually have to produce an artifact at the end. Very much like what a literature review is to a paper, the kids must go back through uh, their questions and find ones where they really went the deepest and where they thought their learning gains were the most. And then use each other's work and build this literature review, if you will, in such a way that it shows and showcases their understanding. When I took their information that they built in their, what I called the e-portfolios, and compared it to an expert source, it either matched it or exceeded it uh, each and every time. And so it's not as if the, when you open these notes, the kids are you know, posting goofy stuff. So we do know what it looks like when the kids actually work with questions and ideas that really interest them. It really gets them thinking the way the experts think. And it also gives the kids an opportunity to work at the cutting edge. Uh, just a quick story, uh, a couple of years ago I, had, um, I was showing a video on dark matter, dark energy, I, I forget what it was, it, it, something along those lines. Uh, but it was near the end of the, the class and the, the bell rang and the kids were, uh, were exiting out and the kid at the back comes up and says, Mr. Wagner, you, you know that question, that question that that guy asked about yeah, that, 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 whatever it was? He said, that's my question. I came up with that question. I mean, that was pretty awesome, you know, to think that he knew that he was playing in the same sandbox as uh, the researcher. Now, in a conceptual way, not in a mathematical way, but you know that they were talking the same language. I'm going to leave you with this a quote by John Dewey. Well, if we teach today as we taught yesterday, then we rob our children of tomorrow. And all I'm asking is that if you think about our curriculum, find that one unit of study, that one area that really interests the kids, and take it and turn it around 180 degrees and ask the kids, you know, what have you been wondering about when it comes to whatever it is? 
and then let them generate the questions and let them generate the learning behind it. And you act as the coach and you just simply say, hey, have you thought about this? Or hey, maybe we can take that question and bring it up a level. You know, go higher up on the Bloom's taxonomy a little bit. Anyway, that's my big idea. And uh, I'm starting to see more and more uh, stuff outside of my own teaching that it seems to strongly suggest that if they're doing that out in the real world, maybe we should be doing a little bit of it in our world as well. So thank you. more in Chicago and the plaque. Uh, his award includes support to the Chicago Convention and he will be presenting